How do you turn a podcast into a book? The WTF host Mark Marin will be here to talk about his new book, Waiting for the Punch. To what extent can the Soviet Union's terrible history be attributed to a single man? Victor Sebastian will join us to talk about his new biography, Lenin, The Man, The Dictator, and The Master of Terror. Alexander Alter will give us an update from the literary world. Plus, we'll talk about what we and the wider world are reading. This is Inside the New York Times Book Review. I'm Pamela Paul. Mark Marin joins us now. He is the author of Waiting for the Punch, which is a new book that is words to live by from the WTF podcast. And he co-wrote it with his producer, Brendan McDonald. Mark, thanks for being here. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. So I feel like you have a podcast, you turned it into a book, and now you're on a book podcast. It's like the circle of life or something. I know. This that... is. I hope something bad doesn't happen because <laughs> we've inverted <laughs> ourselves somehow. What's it like for you going on other people's podcasts, talking about your podcast and, and your book? I don't mind. You know, I'm very aware of the uh, challenges of somebody interviewing somebody. So, and also I like to be challenged by interviewers to a certain degree because one of the things you learn over time when you interview people with public profiles is that they have a public story that they tell over and over again. And part of the challenge of doing a podcast or talking to those people is trying to get around that public narrative that they've used over and over again. So I thought tricky. that was really interesting because you wrote about that in your introduction, the fact that you try to like knock people off their planned narrative. Uh, yeah, get them away from it. I, I don't I don't sandbag people and I'm, I try not to be hostile or weird. A lot of times people criticize me for interrupting and sometimes I'm interrupting because I know the story they're telling and I know they've told it before. And if I interrupt, sometimes we'll get to another place. I would just wanted to interrupt you there, but I... Yeah. I, I chose not to, because that's your thing. Um, <laughs> you can do it. It seems to me, like listening to your podcast, that one of the ways you get people off the narrative is you become part of the story and the conversation. It's much less an interview than it is a conversation. Yeah, I'm I'm very wary to call myself an interviewer ever. I, you know, I talk to people. I like having conversations. I like to, I like to, I feel a need to connect with people. So that's on some level what I'm looking for emotionally. I mean, obviously, I've done a lot of them, so I, I'm sure I have a way of doing it, and I, I, I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. But but usually I want to connect with somebody, which is why I'll, I'll show up for my side of the conversation. It feels like very intensive empathy. Yeah, well, you got to open up. you got to listen. I had to learn sort of how to let silences sit and how to let other people talk, even when I feel compelled to, to interrupt. And, and I've... I've I do it more now where, where I'm very aware of it. Like the, in a moment, what do I gain by interrupting and what do I, what will happen if I don't? And you talk about like being aware now of your own kind of narrative. Did you notice when you were working on this book and you're seeing all of your podcast transcripts sort of on the page, did you recognize mm -hmm. aspects of yourself, of your own narrative, of your own way of talking? I don't know. It was very odd, the experience of, of the book, because Brendan McDonald, who's my business partner in this endeavor and my producer, you know, has an amazing memory. So he, you know, there's 160, almost 160 people in that book. So he was able to remember and cull together, you know, all these bits and pieces and, and, and assemble them under these themes. So my experience in reading them was like, uh, this is really good. Did I have this conversation? <laughs> you, you know, I don't because these are beats. Yeah, yeah, these are moments, you know, maybe less than a minute, some of them, from a conversation. But when you see it on the page, the impact is much different. Like my my uh, experience with these conversations is really just having them. I don't, I'm not part of the editing process. I rarely listen to them again. So it would be remembering somebody you just talked to for an hour one day. So when I see these things, I'm like, wow, this is really good. That that I, I had no idea that that happened. Because yeah, I'm engaged. I, I don't, you, you know, I remember having people over and certain things that happened or what the experience was being with that person. But I don't always remember what was said. So it was a good read for me. Was there anything that was that was not a good read that felt embarrassing or painful or difficult to encounter again for on me? the page? Yeah. Or for them? No, for you. No, I, I don't think so. I, I think that mostly, you, you know, 
I, I can feel uncomfortable and I, and I, but I, they, I don't think that I have many regrets about how these conversations were handled. Some of the vulnerability is, can be a little uh, jarring, but I, I don't, I don't feel embarrassed or ashamed. Your own vulnerability? Sure. Both, you know, like a, a lot of times you're talking to somebody and that, you know, that's the risk of it. Like if I'm going to show myself and which is definitely part of my conversations that if they show up with themselves and, you know, there's something happening that is emotional you know, being there for that person in that moment is part of this. So, and that's heavy, you, you know, because I don't know most of the people I talk to other than maybe I've met them, but mostly not. And, you know, I know of them and we may have common friends or whatnot, but if they get choked up or they're sharing something that's, you know, vulnerable, like, uh, you know, I'm not going to just jump to the next topic. You know, I have to to sit with them with that and have my experience. And sometimes I'll I'll talk about what I'm feeling and give them a Kleenex. I have Kleenex in there if that happens, but it doesn't happen all the time. I feel like I should have Kleenex in here. Why am I starting um, to cry? <laughs> yeah, you're I'm tearing about, up. I'm breaking down. You should see this. <laughs> Are there interviews that you look back on now and you think they should have gone differently or you have any regrets? And I'm actually picking up this particular question. I did the Twitterish thing and I asked some of your listeners and our listeners and readers for their own questions for you. And this one came from Andrew Kuhneman, who actually works in the building here as an editor of Digital <laughs> News Design. And he said, which interviews, he asked me to ask you, which interviews do you feel like you screwed up? Yeah, I don't know that I, I necessarily screwed up interviews. You always, as an interviewer yourself, probably know that you, you talk to somebody and then an hour after they leave, you're like, ah, I, did, I should have made that connection or I right. should have. L'esprit de l'escalier. Yeah, what is that? That's the, it's, it's the wit of the staircase. It's a French expression. It's what you think when you're leaving on your way I like out. that. That's a, it's, nice. it's nice that it was in French, you, you know, that they have that expression. Yes. Yeah. They, I guess French have expressions. Germans have words for th of things that you would never assume had words. But yeah, so like I have that sometimes, uh, but none of them really hang with me. You, you know, I don't like, I'm, I'm not sitting around thinking like, ah, I blew it. But there, there are large chunks of questions because a lot of times people who are fans of people will text me, not text me, they'll tweet at me or they'll email me like, why didn't you talk about this? I'm like, because I didn't know about it. And the, you know, and that's what <laughs> that, that that's usually the the issue. Right. It's like my research is limited, which can be good and bad, but mostly it's fine because usually if I have a conversation that isn't an interview style, you know, they're gonna yeah, it's you're gonna react to the tone of the conversation. Like with Neil Young, I don't know how that conversation unfolded, but it was not going to be easy from the get go, and I could sense that he liked me, but we ended up just you know kind of all over the place and he was just getting some laughs and he was, but you know, I had in my mind questions about his career that he didn't feel like talking about, but you kind of slip him in through the course of a conversation. But it turns out that like, that's a very rare Neil Young conversation because he was laughing, he was having fun. You know, he's talking about going to Pilates. I mean, it's Neil Young. So like even the most, you know, kind of ardent and committed Neil Young fan mm -hmm. is not, they're going to be like, Oh my God, Neil's having a good time. I've right. never heard that before. That's fine. So I don't have, I don't, I don't really think I blew any because they're sitting, I usually hold them in there for at least an hour. And if it's not in going. In the garage, mm -hmm. hostage. And, and if it's not, if I feel like we haven't really connected, I'll keep going. You know, <laughs> it's a weird thing. Like, I think where most people will be like, well, let's just get out. I'll just keep going and wait in just sometimes an hour and a half. I've actually done two-hour conversations just so I know we could get an hour. Is that the goal? Like, to just, like, is there a thing you're trying to get at? Some kind of emotional moment or some kind of insight? I think, that I think so. I don't know if it's an insight, but it's a connectivity that where, where I feel that they are talking from a place that isn't defensive or guarded or, or you know, it's authentic, you know, where, you know, they lock into something. Right. Because a lot of times people, especially public people, can just kind of ramble on and, and give you the talking points that they've established or whatever. But if you wait for a while, something will come up and they'll be like, oh, that yeah, I did this thing. Like when that tone happens right. where they jar themselves out of something. Well, what's interesting is so you're talking now about the tone where you can hear in someone's voice that they're, they're sort of discovering something about themselves. And you, you talked about Neil Young laughing. How does that translate into a book? Does something mm. get lost when you are dealing purely with text and trying to capture those podcasts in words? I found that it was the opposite, like in the sense that when people, when you read what people say, mm -hmm. as opposed to what people write, 
it's going, I feel like it's going into your heart and your mind in a different way. Cause you know, a writer is going to craft a sentence, going to craft a paragraph. God knows what went into that paragraph. Right. So when someone's just speaking from their mind or their heart, you know, in that moment, there's no real filter grammatically or otherwise that would, you, you know, the sensor doesn't involve cutting and pasting. Mm-hmm. You know, they may be calculating in their mind. So, so the emotional immediacy of some of that stuff in the book, when you read it, you can feel it. You know, you're not being worked over. Right. You, you're, you're not being, you're not, you, you, it, well, I, I don't want to discredit writing, but I, I mean, there's a nuance to writing. That's okay. <laughs> There's a nuance to writing, you know, you know that you know pe- people who are writers, they, yeah, they're poetic, but a lot of people are poetic also as they speak. But I'm just, I guess, my point is reading what people say, especially when you're you're pulling out the the most pertinent things that they have said, you know, and, and putting them alongside of other people saying things about a similar theme. That the power of that is very immediate and it's very human, and I think it comes across very strongly in the book in, in a way where you you don't you can't do on the podcast like you can sit and rewind and listen to a, someone saying something over and over again but to sit with a book and to see it in writing is different but there's an editing process to both right you you your podcasts yeah. are taped and you're edited uh-huh. and obviously there's a lot of editing that went into yeah. this book yeah how are they the same or different <laughs> it's a brendan question <laughs> Did, but, was brendan the secret editor or not so secret editor. He's not the secret editor. Brendan's like you know half of that. Like I certainly you know like I do my job, he does his. You know that's always been the way it's been. I've been with him over a decade in this medium, and like I have the conversations. I do everything at my house. I ride the controls. You know I I you know I create the talk, and then he does the other stuff. And you know I don't know that the podcasts you could say are heavily edited. You know they they are shaped. Yeah, really, and they're always shaped to the benefit of the guest and the show and whatever. But this but book this, is like a feat of editing. Yeah, that's all, Brendan. So what was the division of labor? Like, how did you conceive of the book and how did you actually get it down into a book format? Well, we came up with this this notion or this idea. I don't know, why am I using the word notion? That, you know, that, you know, if we take the themes that come up most frequently on the podcast and then organize the book around those as chapters, mm-hmm. that that would be the way to do this. And one of our models, really, in terms of how it reads, was uh, Please Kill Me, Legs McNeil and Jillian McCain's book about the oral history of punk rock. Because mm-hmm. I love the way that reads, where mm-hmm. you just see a name and what they said. Right. It's and like the, the Edie Sedgwick book also. Oh, yeah, yeah, Stein. the oral history stuff. But organizationally, I don't – it was all Brendan because he remembered these things. Like, he's just one of those guys that's sort of – he's a brilliant producer. He uses his brain well. There seems to be a lot of uh, compartments that he – utilizes it that I don't. So it was mostly, you know, based on his notes and his recollection of, of like hundreds of conversations that really put the book together, all the, the bits of conversation. And then I read them over. Right. And then I wrote the, uh, the essays at the beginning of each chapter and the foreword of the book. And that's really it. But the lion's share of the work was Brendan. Shout out now to Brendan McDonald for doing all of that hard work. But I did the conversations. That's yeah, right. I mean, yeah. You did some work, too. A little bit. So how did you pick these themes? Um, you have growing up, parenting, relationships, identity, mental health. Well, yeah, we, we, we thought about how the, sh- you know, how the show works. And, mm-hmm. like, growing up is, like, you know, always part of it. Like, one of the things I do, I need to know where people come from and what their lives look like when they were kids. And that, you know, that's always in most of the podcasts. Right. Uh, in terms of... Parenting, you know, I'm coming at it from being what I, I think, you know, relatively poorly parented on an emotional level. So that always comes up, you know, uh, in one way or the other on the mm-hmm. podcast. Identity is sort of an interesting thing because that sort of can go, that can be about, you know, sexual identity, but also about, you know, how do you come upon who you are, which sort of seem, which has been a journey that I have been on for a long time and it, it comes up. So all these things really are in most of the podcasts, certainly the early ones. One thing that's not here, which was a little surprising, is politics. And I'm going to go back to one of the people who had a question for you on Twitter, and that is Megan Abbott, who's a novelist. She writes thrillers, um, Fever, and other books, and also is a writer for the TV show The Deuce. And she asked, do you feel like you've gotten a lot of new and different listeners since the election? And she felt that the emotion and despair, which is a word right. writers like, was what drew her to the podcast that she felt coming from you. Oh, recently. So yeah. she's a new listener. Yes, yes. She started listening after the election. Right. So emotion and despair, that's that's fine. That's not politics. That's reaction. You know, the, the difficult thing for me was, you know, coming out of being 
in a left, you know, sort of a left-leaning political outlet like Air America, where I, I learned how to do radio at Air America in 2004, and then I was there, and we sort of came up with the idea of the podcast after we were, I was fired and Brendan was let go from Air America because they ran out of money, and I, that would have been like the third time I'd been let go by that company. But entering into the podcast, we were very clear that we were not going to do political stuff. That you know what I wanted to focus on was existential, and what you know were were feelings and and the struggle of just you know being alive and awake in the world that we're in, uh, which is what I do. And it makes it very political in a way too. I mean that decision trying to cope with what's going on out there politically. Yeah, I guess it, like yeah, well during most of the podcast, you know, we were you know Obama was president, and you know I was dealing with my own sort of. Um, search, you know, in terms of what I was coming out of, you know, at the beginning of the podcast, I was not in a good place. And it didn't seem like a lot of the, the, the obstacles in my life were self-generated and that, um, you know, I, I had a certain amount of self-centeredness and, and I just needed to work from, you know, my, my mind and my heart in terms of what was going on with me and, and then talk to other creative people about it. And then once this thing happened, the thing the, that I don't know that we'll ever recover from. Once this uh, election happened and leading up to it, there was no way I could, you know, function emotionally or, or psychologically in the reality of it without talking about it. So not unlike my latest special on Netflix, the comedy special, you know, I, I'm, I'm relatively broad about you know, my reactions, but they are personal reactions. Mm-hmm. They're not policy reactions. They're not like necessarily, you know, name calling reactions or not day to day, but I'm just sort of following the the kind of ebb and flow of my emotional and, and psychological reactions, which are despair and fear and and trying to find some resistance, you know, on a personal level and, you know, in a proactive way, but also trying to function. I'm not a guy that compartmentalizes easy. And, you know, how do you detach enough to, you know, have a day. One of the things I love about the podcast is the beginning where you talk about sort of what you've been up to. Um, yeah. and, and it does seem like that's how, how you cope. And a lot of it is about cultural consumption and travel and sort of the things that inspire you and that you, you see. It also makes your life feel incredibly glamorous to an outsider, so at least weird. like culturally productive. I guess because I, like, I feel like my life is small most days. Okay, one thing that's definitely not small, and I wasn't going to bring him up, but you you did name drop Barack Obama. What was that like to interview President Obama? Well, it was great, you know, because uh, I, like, I, this is a weird thing I have, and I don't know if it's a selfish thing or I don't know what it is, but, like, I've talked to a lot of very, you, you know, big presences. Mm-hmm. What, is that like the, who is the most intimidating? Well, they, I, they're all sort of intimidating to me because you don't know what's going to happen. You know, I'm not I, I'm not protected by you know a sheet of questions necessarily, and and I and I do need to engage. So they they're all sort of intimidating. Mm-hmm. And and then once I get in there, sometimes I'm like, oh, this is going to be okay. Or I don't know how it's going to go. You don't know how it's going right. to go. I just don't know. And as time went on, you know, I was like, well, what's the worst that could happen? We don't get an hour. It doesn't go well. Whatever. But with Obama. I was more prepared than usual because I had to be. And, you know, and I was I was nervous to a degree, but having done, you know, political talk radio and having talked, you know, to politicians and and, and having Brendan as a producer who produces, you know, political television, you know, he's works, worked for MSNBC. You know, like that, you know, and that's also the job of Brendan is like if I'm unclear of how to guide something, mm-hmm. he will help me. Uh, that's a good producer. So with Obama... I was n- nervous to like, you know, like, which do I, do I wear a, a jacket in my house, <laughs> you know, and Just keep it focused on the little things. <laughs> well, I did, you know, and there were certain things we had to get done. And, and, but the biggest challenge was, and this was the part about talking to politicians and he was a sitting president, which I have not done obviously. And he was at my house, but was that, how do I honor what I do? How do we not get into the weeds around policy? Mm-hmm. How do we not get, you know, talking points? Right. How do you get him off his narrative? Right. And and also, like, we only had an hour and like he can talk like he's not, you know, he's, you know, he can, you know, he'll he takes time to deliberate. You Did you know? feel shy about interrupting him? Not after like two minutes. <laughs> I don't know why, but he was very disarming. He was very, you know, grounded. I felt comfortable immediately. Like he walked in the garage. He made fun of me. You know, he had gone to school down the street. Mm-hmm. So it was very candid very quickly. And I was calling him man, you know, and I did finish some of his sentences. But we were able to do 
something for for a good part of the interview that was very candid and you did get a sense of who he was as a person and we did talk about some real stuff because this was two days after that shooting the dylan roof shooting and we didn't even know if he was going to show up we knew that the only way once the gears were in motion that he wouldn't come if there was a national emergency and this felt that way Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'd already done the prep for the house. You know, the Secret Service had been there, you know, and, and, you know, everything was set up. They set up these two isolated phone lines with AT&T, these boxes that in case all communications go down. And and none of this made you nervous? Those made me nervous. Yeah. Just seeing them humming in that room, my spare room. It did make me nervous. I don't know. I was able to detach, but but the but he did come. Yeah. To to you know even with this, so that was on his mind, and he was angry, and you know, and when he showed up, he I could see he was like, "We're gonna have a good time. Everything good." He went into like professional mode. Right. But once you know, I brought it up. You know, the the tenor changed, and it enabled us to have a conversation about guns and a, a little bit about race and in this country. And uh, we talked a little bit about a Supreme Court decision that was coming down the following week. So it, it got heavy for a few minutes, and it was it was great. I was glad I could do that. Did you feel like you had that moment of connection with him? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I definitely. Yeah, he, he, right at the beginning in a way that was intense. But then over time, yeah, he, he got loose. He got, I got some laughs. You know, I, 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 you know, I might have come out of that one with one more question that I didn't feel like I, I, he answered thoroughly uh, or that I— posed well about what was the question which is really about you, you know how do you get used to making decisions where human lives are you know in the balance mm-hmm. you know where you know people are going to get killed like and i wanted to ask it i think that bluntly but i didn't well he'll have a book tour and he'll come back on your <laughs> podcast i wonder you can get him to is come he writing a book? he is writing a book he's writing a another memoir and so is michelle obama oh i wonder if he'd come back to the garage hmm and I know this is the worst question to ask you. It's like it's like asking me what the best book I've ever read is, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Is there a podcast that you've done that sort of stands out as the best podcast you've ever done or the most surprising or It's weird. There you know there's been uh, they all are sort of surprising. There there's never there really aren't any that are surprising one way or the other. You know, cuz you assume you know people and you you don't. That's the interesting thing, because there are many people that come on your podcast and you think, well, I, I think that person is is kind of a jerk. And then they're not. You know, they're all, they all seem, or at least the ones I've listened to, quite likable by the time you get to the end. Well, that's because of- usually you're, you're, well, you're basing your assumption on what? Bits and pieces, you know, roles. You, you know, I mean, so like people are, are kind of like, they're complex and they're, 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 their personalities are much broader than, you know, that what you are associate, whatever's making you have that opinion of them, you know, is based on what? My they're, harsh external judgments. Right, of a, of a, of a role they're playing or, right. you know, some behavior that they did once or whatever. But, yeah, so it's always surprising because, you know, you talk to someone for an hour, you're like, there's a full person there. So if they're not, if they don't turn out to be likable, at least you, you can be empathetic to who they are. You get the sense from listening to you that you genuinely like most of your guests, if not all of them. I don't well, know yeah, if that's I, ever... Well, I, I assume... Well, I, there's some people that I have problems with. Mm-hmm. You know, but like, again, that my experience is like yours. Like, you know, I talk to them for 10 minutes. I'm like, ugh, it's, what am I... Why am I hanging on to whatever the hell that was, you know? But, you know, there, there are moments on the inter, in, in, in the podcast that were like, you know, big moments. And, and I sort of know all those. What are they? Well, you know, I interviewed Keith Richards, you know, and he's a hero of mine. And that was a real fanboy interview. I don't know if it was my best interview, but it was sort of a high point for me in my life. And, you know, and the Louis stuff was good because that was a, a, an honest sort of documented, you know, processing of repairing a friendship. And Ali Wong, you know, pumped her boobs on my show. That was a big day. I'd never seen that before. I'm not married. I don't have children. So, I, yeah, I got to be, I was walked through the, the boob pumping process. <laughs> So that was exciting. But like the one I think about a lot for some reason recently is that Bruce Springsteen interview. And you know, it's weird because a lot of people, like everyone is, has heroes, right? Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of people I talk to are heroes of people, you know, and not necessarily mine. So, I, but I enter conversations knowing that, that this guy or these people are, you know, are some people's favorite person in the world. And I don't want to disappoint those people, right? right? I'm better if I'm talking to somebody who is huge and I'm not fanatic about it. Oh, that's them. interesting because I, I think when you're a fan, that, that the enthusiasm is so infectious that... No, sure. You know, but then that diminishes 
some of their freedom. Because mm-hmm. you know, as a person who is a you know, mid-level celebrity, when someone approaches you with that energy, you don't want to let them down. Right. You know, you're, you, you know and you don't, you know, you want to be polite. Right. You, you know, because uh, that you, that dynamic is understandable, even unconsciously, if you're a celebrity, like, you know, this person's clearly beside themselves. And, and, and you know, so I like those interviews. But Bruce, who I respect deeply mm-hmm. and, and certainly love many of his records, has fans that are like just Bruce all the time. Right. I mean, he's the, the king of New Jersey. You know, he's like people who love Bruce are like they love Bruce. And, I, and I'm walking into that interview at his home. I've never really seen him in concert once at, on a show with other people. I don't have that experience, but I certainly respect him, and I and I love some of his records, and I and I read a lot of the book. But the, but you know, he's a heavy presence, you know, and and the the, the great thing that happened with me and Bruce was like, you know, I go to his house, I'm in his studio, which is on his property, and he and I'd read most of the book, thank God, because it gave me a little bit of insight. I don't usually do that. Don't, don't usually read the book. No, because it makes you lead questions. Mm-hmm. You know, because then it's very hard to not go like, in the book you said, you know. Right. And and I'd rather have that happen organically. So I don't. But like I read the book with uh, Kim Gordon, thank God, because she doesn't talk much. <laughs> and then if I hadn't read the book, I do not know what would have happened. In <laughs> but but the thing I got from Bruce's book was that we we had something in common. We, you know, we're hard on ourselves and we're dark and, you know, we have these issues, some issues. But, but. I knew that Bruce, like his public persona is very, seemingly very organic. Like, hey man, how's it going? Yeah, everything's good. Just hanging out. You know, like he has this, you know, comfort thing. And I knew that. Like I I felt like, well, he seems, always seems pretty earnest. But this book implies something, you know, that he's got in going on inside of him and he's ready to talk about. So there was just a couple moments there where, you know, there was a moment where we connected where, like, he was talking about feeling the most comfortable on stage, you know, because he has control and people love him. And, you know, and, you know, and I'm like, you know, I, yeah, I can relate to that as a comic. And then, uh, and then, then I said something like, uh, you know, like, I just, I just don't, I don't really trust anybody in my real life. I can't trust people. And he's like, of course you can't. Like, uh, so he was yeah, listening. Yeah. And, and, you know, at, there was a point where I'm like, oh, this is happening. You know, we're talking about real stuff, me and the boss. You know, right? And it was great. He's a, he he was really an impressive uh, presence, and 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 I I liked the intensity because like he is a very charming and uh, kind of authentic dude, and I think he is that. But for him to and then we talked about Trump too. For him to sort of admit to his darkness and his anger and that kind of stuff was really moving to me to be in conversation with him around that stuff. All right, so here's a question about your youth that you probably don't get asked on every podcast, which is about the fact that you majored in English literature at VU. Yeah. Did you know that you wanted to do English literature? What was the draw? Well, you know, I think I uh, had, getting out of high school, you know, barely, you you know, my idea was, you know, art and and things intellectual were were what I wanted to do with my life. Mm -hmm. I did that in high school. I was a photographer and my mother was a painter and I was always brought up with a lot of art and things around the house. And one of my uh, mentors owned a bookstore in Albuquerque, Gus Blaisdell, the Living Batch Bookstore. And I'd Is go that still there? Him. No. Aww. He's passed. And, uh, you know, and I'd go there and like, I just listen to him. You know, he taught at UNM and like he was a cultural critic and a film guy. And I just wanted, I aspired to be something along those lines. Like he, like his intelligence and his humor kind of like compelled me and also stand up comedy. And I don't know, once I got to college, I just did whatever I could do. I, you know, I wrote for the paper. I did plays with the, you know, the non-theater school theater company. I edited the literary journal. I wrote poetry. I acted. And it was, uh, it was sort of like pulling together the major, like English lit seemed good. But the problem was I was, I focused on romantic literature and that class for the year that I had to take it as the focus was at like nine in the morning. And, and I was like still drinking and stuff. So I, I never completely wrapped my brain around the romantics because I, <laughs> I was always chasing. But that know, sounds like we, exactly how you're supposed to read the romantics is, you know, <laughs> drunk. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Shelley and Byron and Keats and the crew. Yeah. They, uh, you know, I read them, but like, I was never good at writing papers, but like for me, the studies was really at towards the end of my five years under 
undergrad. You know, what what is it? What am I pulling together here? Mm-hmm. And I like things I was interested in. I did a year long survey in the history of photography with Carl Carenza, and the first semester starts at cave paintings, and then the second semester starts at the beginning of photography. I just thought that stuff was genius, and I took film criticism classes. So the major was was English wit with a minor in film studies. But I was terrible at writing papers. Like, I don't think I could write a paper now, really. Like, I was really good at writing opening paragraphs. Well, that's what you've got here. You've got your opening yeah. sort of several paragraphs to each yeah. of the chapters. That's what I'm good at. I, if I, like, I would turn in papers that were 10 pages of opening paragraphs. Did you, do you go back to those writers at all, the romantics, and ever reread them now that you're not drinking and having to go to class at 9 a.m. in the morning? Have I recently? I think I, I've gone back to Keats, right? Because it was shorter form, some of them, you know. Because like, if you're gonna, <laughs> you know, if you're gonna do Byron or Shelley, I mean, it's still, I mean, you guys, you're, you're in it for a while, right? You've had some writers on the podcast. Generally, people that that's not their main thing. Mm-hmm. But are there authors that you would really want to have on WTF that you haven't had? Come on. I wonder, you know, like you know, my reading is like it's very, it gets, it's sort of like. I, I have to, the book has to really become, come to me recommended. I've been do, reading nonfiction lately. There are writers like, yeah, I think I'd like to talk to Philip Roth, but I don't know. You know, like, I don't know how, like, uh, they, I, we don't have a lot of writers on. I'm friends, some, one of my best friends is a, is a writer who I love, Sam Lipsight. Uh, and I love his books. Mm-hmm. He's, he's funny and he turns me on to people. But I, I don't know, you know, I don't know about writers because, uh, like, it's, I don't know if it's their job to talk, is it? No, it's their job to write. It's their job to write. They're, it, I think a lot of— I, I mean, talked to uh, that kid, uh, that kid, uh, what's his name, Beatty, the guy who wrote The Sellout. Paul that, Beatty. Paul Beatty. Yes. Because that, that book was so hysterical and so impressive. Uh, what an amazing work of satire. And that was a tricky interview. He's sort of a tricky guy. And, uh, but it worked out okay. But, but it, was, it was not easy. Yeah. There are fiction writers who are very able to talk about their work, and they come on this podcast, obviously. And then there's some who really do prefer to leave it at what is on the page. Right, and I think that's fine. I mean, I do like like nonfiction. I've read, you know, I like I had Sam Quinones uh, mm-hmm. with the with Dreamland, mm-hmm. which that book just blew me away, and he lives by me, so that was great as a journalist. But that was great. John Ronson, I have on often because you know he's great. Yeah. But I haven't, I really haven't had that many. I've had Sam on. I don't even think I've had him for a full hour. And I've had Jerry Stahl on as, in terms of fiction writers, mostly because they're my good friends and they're great writers. So you said you were reading mostly nonfiction lately. What else have you been reading? Oh, I don't know. I, I, like, I, what, have, what have I been, what do I carry around with me to, to try to Yeah, like, what did you read on the plane coming here? I didn't, I didn't read anything. Like, I sit and space out on the plane. You know, I tend to listen to music more than I read, and then I'm consumed with the news, so I'm, like, running through that all day long. I, I carry around the baffler with me, that mm-hmm. quarterly. I carry that around with the, with the desire to read it, but I, I find it very intimidating sometimes. All right, so if you're going to recommend, though, one, let's say, to make it a little easier, underappreciated, underread writer who you think deserves a greater audience, who would it be? So it's my friend Sam. Sam Lipsight? Yeah. He's got lots of readers. We he, love he Sam. He deserves a bigger audience. All Sam right. is one of the funniest writers out there and his intelligence. And he is a sentence guy. I mean, he may have a lot of readers, but he doesn't have bestseller readers. Where's Where's Sammy's bestseller? Well, hopefully more people will read Sam Lipsight's. What's your favorite Sam Lipsight book? Well, I think that The Ask, the last one was really like, you know, a great. Homeland's great too, but like The Ask is great. And and it's just like, here, let me tell you a story about Sam Lipsight. He's so funny, you know, and, and he's a real, like I said, he's a, he, he every sentence is, is <laughs> exactly how he wants it to be. He lent me Philip Roth's Sabbath Theater, mm-hmm. which is a pretty big book. Yes. It's an odd book for Philip Roth. It's a great Philip Roth book. He lent me his hardback of that. And in the whole book, there was one sentence underlined, and it wasn't even that long a sentence. I don't even remember what it was. What? No, you have that, to tell no, us no, what no, sentence it no, was no, now. No, 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 the better thing is that, like, I asked Sam, why is one sentence in the book underlined? He goes, that was really the best sentence in the book. <laughs> I know you want to know what the sentence is, but yeah, I think crazy. what's more important is that Sam isolated one sentence in a huge book that being the best sentence. All right. Well, leaving us very much in suspense, Mark, thank you for being here. 
Thank you for having me. The book, again, is Waiting for the Punch, Words to Live By from the WTF podcast. And Mark Marin is, of course, the host of the WTF podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Victor Sebastian is the author of a new biography of Lenin. It's called Lenin, the Man, the Dictator, and the Master of Terror. He joins us now from Heathrow Airport. Victor, thanks so much for being here. Well, it's a great pleasure, Pamela. Thank you for asking me. This is the first biography of Lenin in English in two decades, which seems kind of shocking, especially when you think about how many biographies of Stalin have been published in recent years by contrast? Yes, it, it, is, it is rather surprising. Quite a lot of the early archives for the early Bolsheviks were quite hard to locate. I mean, people, I, I wasn't the first with some of them, but I have been with, with, with some others. And that's part of a reason. Partly it's because the, the, Lenin, I mean, Stalin was just more sort of more fashionable. And one hopes to re- redress that now because, you know, one goes back at the you know the root, the root of it all, and and you can see just how important it was, and and the timing is just just right because of the revolutionary situation we're we're in with uh, what's happening in our modern modern era. So, um, but it, I, you know, it is surprising, and Lenin's reputation was caught. The previous one, the previous biographies, some of them excellent in their way. I'm not knocking any of them, especially the last one in English by. Professor Robert Service's book was was exceptionally good, but but most of them are caught one side or the other in the in the in the Cold War. You know, on the one side he was the he was the pillar of all Bolshevik rectitude. On the other side he was he was you know evil the evil genius. And I I think one can be a little bit more dispassionate about um, that and a bit more just a bit more objective, and you can see what he was really was. And my purpose as a as a as a biographer of, sort of popular history, is looking at Lenin the man rather than Lenin the idea, and that's what I've tried to do. Well, let's talk a little bit about Lenin the man going back to his childhood. Where was he born and when, and what was his childhood like? Well, he was born in 1870 in a provincial town about 600 miles southeast of, of, of Moscow on, on the River Volga. He was an he was a, as a nobleman. He wasn't a, the pro, he wasn't a proletarian man of the people at all. His his father he's a very middle very upper middle class. His father had got got a noble title from his rank in the civil service. He was a um, a schools inspector of a, of a large province in Russia. He was incredibly well educated. Came from a high bourgeois family. All his he 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 had the manner of an aristocrat. Unlike many people who became dictators or whatever, he came from a very loving family, very stable, had a very happy childhood. Unlike Stalin, whose childhood was miserable, he was extremely well educated. By education was the most important thing in his in his upbringing. He was very sophisticated intellectually. Were his parents political? Did he grow up thinking about politics? Absolutely not, and nor was he until um, he was he was seventeen. He, he they were totally unpolit- apolitical. His father was a, was a civil servant, but and was a supporter of sort of moderate moderate reforms, but really not not political at all. What changed him was the execution of his brother, who was very political as he was a student. He he was executed for taking part in an assassination plot against the Tsar Alexander the Third. And that is what radicalized Lenin. And his, his brother was executed just, uh, just a few weeks after his 21st birthday. Lenin thought, whose name was really was Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov. Lenin was a, was a pseudonym. Lenin became political after that. And it wasn't just that the execution of his brother, what happened was that the whole family were then shunned. After his brother, Sasha, was, was arrested, his mother tried to get from some provincial Simbirsk to St. Petersburg to plea for clemency. And Lenin couldn't find anybody in bourgeois Simbirsk who'd go and accompany his mother to, to go to St. Petersburg. And the whole family were, were more or less excommunicated and shunned. And that is as much, that, 
the feeling of re- wanting revenge for that, in my view, drove him as much as any belief in you know Marx's theory of surplus value. He was very driven by emotion, Lenin. And how did he get from that point to becoming a communist, becoming a Marxist? Well, then he started reading all the works that his brother had read, all the all the the, um, the books from 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 the old um, Russian traditional Russian socialist revolutionaries through to Marx, and it was Marx. It was well, Marx really was a, a conversion, almost like a Marxists like to think they're very scientific, but actually it's pretty much like a religion, and it was almost like a religious conversion. He was a brilliant scholar, but he was also a, 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 in politics a real autodidact. You know, he 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 read and he, and he spent two years just reading and reading absolutely everything he could lay his hands on about politics. Did people see him as a likely leader? Not until a bit later, when he when 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 he started joining socialist groups when he was in St. Petersburg, he they, he did then. He was he was he, because he was so obviously incredibly clever and and so obviously had a very very clear view. And he he was a master in argument, master in argument. He 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 was abusive. He was. He, he brought down the level of argument, in, you know, which had been quite high-minded. I mean, he would use expletives. He would use, he would use any dirty trick in argument relentlessly. Um, but people did see him as a leader after that because he had a very clear-eyed view of how Bolshevik, how his group could, could get power. He had a very clear-eyed view about how you could organise a revolutionary party, a secret conspiratorial revolutionary party. And he said, he said in one of his most famous works, "What is to be done?" Mercifully brief, I will, I will tell you, as opposed to some of the um, incredibly long track. But um, he, he could, he, he could say, "Give me a hundred people, loyal and intelligent people, and we could change Russia." And that's what basically what he did. Let's talk about some of those views, because many of the things that we think about when we talk about the Soviet Union, the one-party state, the elimination of free elections, the ban on dissent, killing all one's enemies, we attribute to Stalin. But these were really Lenin's ideas. Absolutely. It's, it, it, it's been a, it's been a, um, you know, the, the, the arguments on the, on the, on the far left for, for the last 80 years has always been that Lenin was the great idealist. And if only he'd lived a little bit longer, he died at 54. If only he'd lived a little longer and carried, carried forward his vision, everything would have been different. Well, I, I don't believe that's true at all. Lenin laid the foundations, built up all the institutions of terror that Stalin used much more effectively you know, a decade or a decade and a half later. Lenin created the Gulag. Lenin had built up the one the one party state. It was Lenin intolerance that made the party the leading the one communist party the leading organ of the state. It was Lenin who who created the Cheka, which then turned into you know you know the KGB later on. All these institutions and the idea that that the dissent was heresy and therefore to be stamped out. All this came from Lenin. The idea that winner takes all, the idea that the ends will always justify the means, that's, that's, that's Lenin. Stalin learned all this. I mean, Stalin believed in it all. Stalin was a, of course, he was a maximalist too, but he, but, but he was only using, he called himself the, the follower of Lenin, and he was the follower of Lenin. Given the extremity of all of these ideas, I'm curious too about what he was like personally and, and what his personal life was like and was there a consistency with the way he behaved in public um, and the way he behaved in private he, he was like the like his upbringing a kind of gentleman in in you know in in, in private and, be, and he didn't have too many friends because anyone who disagreed with him politically ceased to be a friend the other thing i that i found in my research which surprised me quite a lot actually was that all the close, all the important relationships in his life were with women? Um, I don't mean se- necessarily mm. sexual ones. I mean, they were, they, they, he 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 took notice of women every bit as much as he as he took notice of of, of men, and he took them and he took them seriously. This is something that's rarely, I think, been mentioned. But when one looks at his letters, when one looks at what what he did in his personal relationships with others. He was not, in any sense, a monster. And in fact, he 
he wasn't a monster at all in the way that, you know, that, that Stalin was or Mao or Hitler or whatever. He was, to him, the deaths were mainly, they were theoretical. He understood you had to have terror, but it, but it wasn't, it wasn't a personal terror. He didn't, he wasn't the kind of dictator who wore military tunics. He didn't go on to the front in any of the, you know, in the civil war. But power is what motive, motivated him. But he behaved decently as an individual human, human being on the whole. In the big numbers and in the big, in the big things, he was an absolute monster. But in personal relationships, he wasn't. It's a question I think many biographers get. We were talking about this last week on the podcast with Ron Chernow, who just wrote a biography of Ulysses S. Grant. Do you have to admire or like your subject in order to write about this person? It, it, that's a hard question, I would imagine, with, with someone like Lenin. But is there anything that you admire about him? Oh, there's, well, admire, I'm impressed rather mm-hmm. than admire. I mean, I lived with Lenin for three years, which I can tell you is more than is healthy for you know for any for anybody really. But I did. I was more and more impressed by him. How did he do it? How did a man who, throughout most of his life, lived in you know exile in boarding houses in in European cities, didn't live at all wealthily, did just went to the library or wrote articles or whatever? How did a man with like that, with just a few followers for most of his life? end up running one of the biggest empires the, the, the world had ever seen. It's a great story. I mean, as a, you know, as a, as a historian or as a, you know, as I was as a journalist for long, it's an amazing, it's an amazing story, I, the one I wanted to tell. Obviously, luck and happenstance and um, all that make, make a difference, but each individual um, makes their own, you know, makes their own luck. So I was more impressed by him. I hated him more. As well, when you see in his own handwriting, constantly talking about shooting people and you know, mercilessly getting rid of them and destroying whole classes of society, you it, you find it quite hard to like someone. But your answer is, how do you write about someone who is who is horrible or or has done horrible things? <sighs> if you stop writing about these people, each generation will forget. We're in danger mm-hmm. of forgetting it now as we move further to the, you know, something move further to a kind of populist revolutionary position. I think e- and each generation has to interpret the lives of these people who have changed history so profoundly, I think. so. And to be perfectly honest, they're a lot more interesting than, you know, than what often than wet liberals who don't, you know, who are always so moderate and moderate, moderate views. So I just think, I think these people have to be assessed all the time, constantly. I mean, you mentioned Stalin. There have been a lot of Stalin. I mean, Stephen Copkins has written one and just, you know, produced another one in his second in his, in his series. Seabag Montefiore has written, you know, two volumes within the last few years. And Hitler, Hitler's being, you know, there's so many, so many biographies of Hitler. I think each generation has to track all them. When you think about the relevance of Lenin and his life and his impact, to what extent is Putin's Russia today attributable to Lenin? How evident is his legacy? Well, there is a kind of continuum. He's in the direct line of, of rule um, in many, you know, many ways. The Russian Federation is a direct descendant of Lenin's creation, the Soviet Union. So to that extent, I think he owes a lot. The Russian, as Putin doesn't read much, but he does read quite a lot of Russian history. And he would regard, he would regard the whole of Russia's history as a continuum. So very, very, very much he's in that, that sort of tri- tradition. But of course, he's finding it very hard to mark this this centenary mm-hmm. um, in in Russia, they're hardly marking it at all. Whereas in where I am in London, there have been two major exhibitions, of art exhibitions. The whole the BBC Radio and BBC Television is full of programmes this month about Russia, it's Russia mania. In Russia, it's hardly being marked at all. The biggest event probably in their modern history is almost being completely ignored. It's a cu- it's very curious this, but but you know deliberate. Putin wants no talk of revolution. It doesn't send a, a very good message mm-hmm. um, to his people that you can that you can get rid of a, a corrupt autocrat through revolution. So it is a message he doesn't want to send out there. And yet, 
he still keeps Lenin in his mausoleum. He still keeps lots of lots of statues to to, to Lenin that are still there in in quite a lot of towns in Russia. He's he was a he was a big Russian figure, so you can't ignore him completely. So it's 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 quite it's quite a dilemma for Putin and the people now how you around him now of just how you of, of how you deal with Lenin. See, it's much easier for him to deal with Stalin mm-hmm. because Stalin you could package as a, a and he does. He's rehabilitated Stalin as a Russian nationalist who built a huge empire after the Second World War, extended the borders, you know, extended the border, preserved and extended the borders of of Tsarist Russia. He starts modern Russian history in 1945, the victory in the Great Patriotic War, and not not in 1917. And yet in 2011, he did uh, oversee the refurbishment of Lenin's yeah, mausoleum. The mausoleum was falling down, and he invested large sums of money in, in, um, in making sure it stayed up. Because there is a dilemma, you can't write him out of history completely. And, and a whole generation of people were brought up in the Leninist way. And, and you can't just, his view and the people around him were saying, well, you can't just get rid of it. It's like saying to all those people that these 70 years were wasted and Russian history is this continuum. It's quite, a, they can elide over all kinds of things in Russia. You can think three impossible things at once in Russia and sort of be happy about it. In a way, it's much harder, I think, in, in the West. That's interesting, alarming that Putin would choose to rehabilitate Stalin over They're Lenin. Buildings, new statues in some places of Stalin. Lenin's actually quite a recognizable political phenomenon, a modern political phenomenon, uh, the kind of demagogue that would be that's quite familiar today. He'd, he, he, although he wrote massive texts, he could also be incredibly direct. And his great rallying cry for you know for the revolution was very very simple. It was peace, land, bread. And um, Lenin would have been fantastic on Twitter. He, he could get a simple message across in very simple, direct ways. I mean, Peace Land Bread, a lot less than 140 characters. He would have been really, really good on radio. The populism he espoused is, is, is you can see it, you can see it all over the place now. You know, you lie, you lie shamelessly, you promise, you promise very simple solutions to complex problems, you, you identify an enemy of the people, you know, the, or a saboteur. You, when things go wrong, the same principles apply to quite a few people around nowadays. He is very recognizable. Well, I hate to think of him having access to Twitter. Victor, <laughs> thank you so much. Very intrepid of you to join us from Heathrow Airport. I really appreciate it. I think they're calling my flight and they're talking about security reasons. That's a very, that's a very KGB type thing. All right. Well, our our signal to close then. Um, the book again is Lenin, The Man, the Dictator, and the Master of Terror by Victor Sebastian. And Victor, thank you again. Well, thank you very much for, for, for asking me. I enjoyed it. Alexandra Alter joins us now to talk about what's going on in the literary world. Hi, Alexandra. Hi, Pamela. So it's Booker season or Booker season is sort of over. Yes, another major literary award we can cross off this year. The Man Booker Prize was awarded this week. And in what was, I think, a surprise choice for a lot of observers, it went to George Saunders for his novel Lincoln and the Bardo, which was extremely well-reviewed. But I think people were surprised to see the Booker go to another American author a second year in in a row after Paul Beatty won for the sellout last year. It's interesting because I was talking to a publisher yesterday about this, and she said that all of her British friends were talking about this novel, that they, it was, one theory is that this is sort of the America that the Brits really like, you know, like it's Lincoln Lincoln (laughs) and it's mournful and it's American ghosts and that, that it's the side of our history that the and character that they maybe appreciate. That's a really interesting read. That's a, that's a fascinating analysis. And I think it is notable that 
both Lincoln and the Bardo and Paul Beatty's The Sellout, which is sort of a satire about race in America, deal with very American themes. And of course, you know, when the judges were asked about this, about awarding the prize to an American again, because there was so much of an uproar when they opened up the prize. When did they open it? It was in 2014. So previously, the prize goes back to 1969. And initially, it was only open to authors from Britain, Ireland, and the Commonwealth nations. And then in 2014, they opened it up to any novel written in English and published in Britain. And ever since those rule changes were made, you've seen a lot of American authors on the long list and on the short list and a lot of kind of consternation about Americans kind of overtaking this quintessentially British prize when we have so many of our own literary prizes. So it was interesting to see that choice made again this year. But of course, the judges noted that it's an entirely different set of judges every year. They're judging the works purely based on their literary merit. They're not considering nationality. And one of the things I thought was actually, you know, beyond the the question of nationality and, and it going to an American again, I thought the fact that this was such an experimental and unusual novel was interesting. And I think mm-hmm. that might be one of the things they wanted to highlight. So, you know, this this novel, which was tremendously well-reviewed when it came out in February, is almost like a collage. It's There's a lot of snippets of dialogue. It takes place in the cemetery where Abraham Lincoln was visiting the, the corpse of his 11-year-old son, Willie, who had died of typhoid. It is such a haunting story. It is. It is. I mean, you can, you, it's, su- it's such a visceral sort of, you can picture this president grieving, you know, ho- apparently going into the crypt and even holding his son's body. And George Saunders had heard the story almost 20 years before he started working on the book, and he just it just never left him. And when I spoke to him on Tuesday about kind of the inspiration for this for this novel, he said he's so well known for his short stories, like his collection Tenth of December, and those stories tend to be dystopian and futuristic and satirical and dark and funny and kind of oblique in their emotion. Whereas this, he felt like, was such an emotional story. I mean, a father grieving over his son, you can't really top that in terms of, you know, having to summon like the emotional force of that story. And it felt, he said he felt like he would have to be too earnest and he couldn't quite take it on. But eventually, you know, he felt like he couldn't run away from it anymore. He had to try it. And and uh, it was incredibly well received. And so I think what gives it its George Saunders flavor is the supernatural element. So as Lincoln is visiting his son in the cemetery, all these other ghosts pipe up, and that's where the the title comes from, Lincoln and the Bardo. The Bardo refers to this state between death and rebirth in Tibetan Buddhism, and uh, George Saunders is a Buddhist, and he is sort of steeped in that tradition as well. So it was interesting to see him take what could have been a very straightforward historical novel and overlay it with all this sort of strange supernatural activity and dialogue and also to bring in this philosophy that he practices himself. And so does this mark now the end of the award season until the National Book Awards? Is that the next one? The on National November Book 15th? Awards is the next big one, yeah. Okay. So we're marching towards that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this was, you know, again, I think like we saw with the Nobel with Kazuo Ishiguro winning the Nobel, um, it's interesting to see these kind of beloved but very well-known, well-established writers getting the prize. Um, there was a lot of celebration on social media after the announcement went out that George Saunders had won. A lot of writers really love his work, and um, and so I think people appreciated that the prize went to somebody who was taking a risk. And they felt deserved to be recognized. Exactly. All right. Thanks, Alexandra. Thanks for having me. Joining us now, my colleagues Greg Coles, Concepcion de Leon, and Jen Salai. Hi, guys. Hi, Hi, Pamela. Pamela. All right, let's talk about what we're reading, and we'll start with you, Greg. I've got a tradition at this time of year going decades back. The Best American Collections come out, and I always read the Best American Short Stories, Best American Essays, and these these series have only expanded. There's now Best American Science writing and science fiction and a bunch of other things. And they get great editors, too. They they really do. Uh, again, a, a tradition of great editors. The Best American Short Stories this year, which uh, I'm partway through, is guest edited by Meg Wallitzer, who, of course, is the author of The Interestings and The Wife and, you know, a, a lot of novels. Um not so much a short story writer herself. She's mm-hmm. really better known as a novelist. You know, her sensibility really comes through in this collection. It's one of the the great things about The Best American is that 
depending who they ask to edit that year, you get such a different range of voices, a different mm-hmm. range of stories, depending on the editor. Last year, um, the guest editor was Junot Diaz, and it was a very diverse collection that year. Um, this year, there's a, a lot of names uh, I'm more familiar with. T.C. Boyle is in here. Jess Walter is in here. Curtis Sittenfeld mm-hmm. uh, is in here. In her introduction and also in Heidi Pittler's foreword, Heidi Pittler is the series editor who puts this together every year. They really talk about kind of the political context of um, picking these stories right during the election season and then immediately after the election. And and Heidi Pittler makes a point in her foreword of saying this is probably the last batch of Best American Short Stories that will have been written before the 2016 election. And so she kind of looks forward to what future anthologies might look like, what it might look like to be writing fiction after the 2016 election. What have you read in here that's particularly good? I'm I'm really enjoying right now a story by a woman named Leopoldine Kaur. It's called Hog for Sorrow. It was published in Bomb Magazine. And it is about a couple of call girls and the visit to them by, by by a man it, it's about the relationship between these two call girls, but there's something in the um, kind of taking you into this milieu that I was not <laughs> familiar with. It feels almost science fiction-y just in, because it, it's entree into a, a completely different kind of a world, but it, it's very kind of crystalline and, and well done. All right, Concepcion, you also are reading stories. I am, and it's so funny. We were talking about this earlier. I actually am not a huge fan of short stories. I've always enjoyed novels more. I really just like the feeling of, like, leaving a novel and, like, really feeling like you connected with the characters and, like, they were all really drawn out and uh, explored as much as they could be. And I just never feel that way with the short stories that I've read. But admittedly, I'm not in- extremely well read in the short story arena. Mm-hmm. Um, but I started reading Her Body and Other Parties by Carmen Maria Machado. And I've had trouble over the last few months finishing a novel, essentially. And so I'm like, well, let me try a s- short story because it's manageable and small. Previously, I read We Were Eight Years in Power by ta Coates. And that was really nice because they were sectioned off in a way that you kind of could say like, well, I'm going to read this much today and, and mm-hmm. leave the rest for tomorrow. So I'm trying it and I'm enjoying it so far. It's essentially, it's a book of short stories and they all deal with women's bodies essentially, mm-hmm. but they also have sort of like a magical realism element. I think they're based in fables and myths and fairy tales, which is really interesting and really right up my alley. Like I love fairy tales. So yes, yeah, so I'm about halfway through it and I, I'm really impressed by it. I think that she does a really great job of like introducing the sort of more mystical elements or or um, fantastical elements, but still making it feel very real and and very, very much so a part of the action and also keeping it very close to women's bodies and and keeping that sort of visceral connection, which I am really impressed by. So, so far, so good. All right. You're reading something much older. Right. From a while ago. So this weekend I saw for the first time since I guess maybe For the first time in 15 years, when it first came out, I saw the movie Adaptation again, Mm -hmm. which I don't know if any of you here. Yes, that's the exactly (laughs) Chris Cooper. Meryl Streep is in it. It's um, based on a screenplay by Charlie Kaufman, and it's essentially about his attempt to write a screenplay of Susan Orlean's book, The Orchid Thief, which is the book that I'm reading right now. And so after seeing that, I, I realized that. You know, I had never read The Orchid Thief, and it just made me really curious because he has such a hard time in the film writing the screenplay, and then everything gets really weird. (laughs) And I don't want to give away any spoilers, so I decided to pick up the book, and I'm about maybe a third or so into it, and I'm really, really enjoying it. It's incredibly written. I mean, she has this real gift for sort of distilling all these bits of information, whether it's about orchids and botany or history and the history of orchid hunters, which is also totally bizarre and fascinating. Mm -hmm. And also the character of John LaRoche, who is the orchid thief, whom she follows in the book and also in the movie, who's played by Chris Cooper. Right. (laughs) And so reading this, though, I, I can see how... If you're Charlie Kaufman and you're coming to it and you're tasked with picking a story to tell, it becomes just really difficult to pick which thread you're going to go with. 
But the character of LaRoche is really just sort of astounding and amazing. And um, she has this great part near the beginning where they're driving around Florida. And, you know, he's telling her that he sometimes will pour chemicals on seeds, orchid seeds, and also put things in the microwave to see if they mutate, Mm -hmm. which I didn't, I, I don't think is in the movie. And so... You know, so she expresses to him that she's really kind of surprised by this. And so this is how he responds. And when he glanced at me and caught my expression, he took both hands off the wheel and waved them (laughs) at me dismissively. Oh, come on, he said. Mutation's great. Mutation's really fun. It's a great little hobby. You know, mutation for fun and profit. And it's cool as hell. You end up with some cool stuff and some ugly stuff and stuff no one has ever seen before, and it's just great. <laughs> and I just, I mean, because I had just seen the movie, I couldn't help but just think of Chris Hearing Cooper, it, but yeah. essentially. But in any case, the book right now, I'm in a chapter where she's talking about going to this gala of orchid people, essentially, who are very rich collectors of orchids who can afford to really house these flowers that need to live under certain very particular conditions. So. It's interesting with certain nonfiction books that are optioned, the film rights are optioned, and you always wonder, well, how on earth are they going to turn this into right. a story? With narrative nonfiction, it can be easy to imagine, but a lot of it, you, you really have to kind of— expository. Yeah, and you have to kind of con- create a story in that, you know, in that world. And it's, and it's interesting to sort of think about how much the— film adaptation becomes, uh, I'm talking about the specific adaptation of the film, becomes a story about Susan Orlean, Mm -hmm. ostensibly. I mean, that's like like also a It's like about creativity and about who owns the story and how do you take someone else's story. And also about Hollywood and their expectations for what a story should be, because part of the whole thing is Charlie Kaufman, in the film at least, has a twin brother who's very, (laughs) very different. Also played by Chris Cooper. No, oh, no, play oh, Nick Cage. Nick Cage. <laughs> Nicholas Cage. Oh, right. Nicholas Cage. Right. It's the good Nicholas Cage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's Nicholas Cage play, playing both twin brothers. And then when the brother takes over the narrative at the very end is, well, again, I don't want to give it away, but it's just you sort of see things get very meta very quickly. Sounds like just your thing. <laughs> <laughs> and Pamela, what are you reading? Well, I finally finished Kate Atkinson's One Good Turn. Which I loved. It's uh, the third of her Jackson Brody books that I've read. Um, I haven't been reading them in order. Case Histories is the first one. And it also read Started Early, Took My Dog, I think mostly based on the title. But I enjoyed all of them. This one took me a while to get into, and it wasn't really a reflection of the quality of the book, but it was one of those novels that is rotating among various characters and you can't quite see how they connect. It took a little bit of time for it to get going for me. Once people started to, you know, be killed, um, it, <laughs> it, it began to cohere and then it was just great and I raced to the end. And I've continued reading in my collection of Washington Irving. This particular collection is from Penguin Classics, and it's called The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and other stories. But it was originally published together as a collection as the sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon, Gentleman, which Mm -hmm. is kind of wonderful. I just want to read one little thing from the introduction because we were talking earlier in the podcast about George Saunders winning the Booker. So in the introduction, which is written by Elizabeth Bradley, She says, It must be admitted that Irving's stories do endure as the first fictional chronicle of the American experience and that the unorthodox, fantastical sensibilities he displayed in his tales of the Hudson River Valley set the stage for the romantic and gothic writers who followed him, including Hawthorne, Melville, Poe, and Whitman. Certainly, the absurdist Knickerbocker sensibility of his early satires may be felt in the humor of Twain and Thurber, and even, most recently, the stories of George Saunders and Karen Russell, while his foray into regional literature, America's First, was followed by that of Sarah Orne Jewett, Mark Twain, and Sherwood Anderson, for starters. And when you think about that, it's really kind of amazing. Um, I, I hadn't thought about the fact that he really did precede all of those writers and this collection is, is very mixed, and some of it is really dated. I'm not going to talk about the one called The Wife, um, which is <laughs> very not dated. The Meg um, but I want to talk about Rip Van Winkle, and I want to start it off by asking: Have you any of you read Rip Van Winkle? No. 
No, right? So it's one of those stories so. that you, everyone knows about. I don't think anyone really reads. I, so. I may have read it actually in like sixth grade. Right. So what do you remember or what do you know of the story of Rip Van Winkle? Because everything I knew or thought I knew was wrong. And I'm curious <laughs> about it. Does he not fall asleep? He does fall okay. asleep. <laughs> For like 20 years, he wakes up, his wife is dead. You know much more than the average American. Right? <laughs> oh, well, so um, I didn't because realize in, that that's part of it. Right. In my mind, dies. he I thought he slept for longer, first of all. I thought he slept for something like 75 years. I didn't know about the wife. Yeah. Um, but do you know anything about the wife? No, I didn't even know that so, there was a wife. No, so he he's he has a, in a terrible marriage to this you know, horrible, nagging wife. He's got these great descriptions of her. Again, a little bit dated, but I'm going to share them. Rip Van Winkle was one of those happy mortals of foolish, well-oiled dispositions who take the world easy, eat white bread or brown, whichever can be got with least thought or trouble, and would rather starve on a penny than work for a pound. If left to himself, he would have whistled life away in perfect contentment, but his wife kept continually dinning in his ears about his idleness, his carelessness, and the ruin he was bringing on his family. Morning, noon, and night, her tongue was incessantly going, and everything he said or did was sure to produce a torrent of household eloquence. Um, and it, it goes on um, in so it's that. basically the ant and the grasshopper. Yes. Uh, so so, so he, he, he goes off on a hike in the Catskills and finds himself among these old, peculiar, sort of early Dutch settlers kind of gambling away and then begins to drink from their flagon of a non-specified beverage and then falls asleep and he wakes up and it is 20 years later. But what's interesting is he he goes back into his town and doesn't realize what happens or why anyone is looking at him until he feels that his beard has grown to be a foot long. But then it's 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 a short, very short story and uh, the denouement sort of, it's it, very rapid. He knows some people. He doesn't know others. Certain people recognize him. He ends up meeting up with one of his daughters and moves in with her and sort of lives happily ever after. <laughs> so it's, I think we, we we read a lot of meaning into the story that, you know, on the page, in a way, it it's a little disappointing because it's, it's like slightly <laughs> less magical. A monumental figure. Yes, yes. Like. Um, that we, yeah. we, that we've, that, that sort of has subsequently taken on this whole other life and this symbol that isn't entirely there on the page. But I will say, and, and I, I, I offer no explanation, that I read this right before bedtime last night. And for the first time in many nights, I did sleep the entire night through until morning, like a full nine hours. So I felt like I, I had somehow set the stage. Channeled exactly. I picked up on the tradition. Anyway, thanks, guys. Thank thanks, you. Pamela. Thank you. Remember, there's more at nytimes.com slash books, and you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. Inside the New York Times Book Review is produced by Pedro Rosado from Headstepper Media. Thanks for listening. For the New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul. Mm-hmm.